God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That little phrase, written somewhere in the middle of the 20th century by an American theologian, has become extremely well known, probably because it is a creed of the 12-step program initiated by the alcohol, uh, Alcoholic Anonymous movement, but it is also something that most people these days know, recognize, and even subscribe to. Well, at least they say they do. Most of us who hear that recognize the wisdom in it, recognize the value of it, but struggle to implement it. Acceptance is something really hard to implement. Arthur Rubenstein fam famously said, of course, there is no formula for success except perhaps an unconditional acceptance of life and what it brings. There is so much importance in the idea of, the accept of acceptance that it's actually considered the central philosophy of the Stoic philosopher Marcus Aurelius. And, in fact, it might be considered a, a central tenet of Stoicism itself. Accept what, the, what is so that you can find what is under your control and what isn't. Ultimately, a very big part of healing and recovering from pain is about acceptance. So today we'll talk a little bit about acceptance and how to try and bring more acceptance in our lives and we'll return to old Marcus Aurelius and see how um, acceptance is such an important part of his philosophy and as he would argue of the ultimate truth about life itself. But more about that later. One of the things in the Stoic philosophy that we've often spoken about on this show is distinguishing between what is under your control and what isn't under your control. And one of the other key tenets of Stoic philosophy is that ultimately you should only be concerned with those things that are in your control. You should only be putting your thought into that, your energy into that, and your action into that. And they point out that we spend and waste an inordinate amount of time worrying about things that are fundamentally outside of our control. Most things are outside of our control, whether they're in the control of other people or in the control of nature itself. I mean, we worry about the weather, for example. So, most of what we put our energy into is what can't return anything to us. We waste an enormous amount of energy and create an enormous amount of stress or strain, or what we might say in a modern language, pain for ourselves by continuously fretting over um, those things we can't control and even worse, trying to control them when we can't, which obviously produces very bad results at best and enhances the feelings of pain and anguish and lack of control. So the one aspect of dealing with that is focusing on what you are in control of. So identifying those things, focusing on those things, putting your energy onto those things very fundamentally changes your life. But what are we supposed to do about those things which we're not in control of? They're still there, even if we're focusing only on those things that we are in control of. And what we can't do is walk around in happy oblivion about uh, those things about which, uh, which we're not in control of, not worrying about them, not putting any of our energy into them. Sounds fantastic and would produce fantastic results, but the world keeps on happening around us. And all of those things which are not in our control keep on impinging upon us and impinging upon our reality. I mean, if our reality only consisted of those things which we are actually in control of, 
we'd be very much happier. And so breaking through that ideal or that fantasy is the real world all the time, apart from the fantasy of we're in control of a whole bunch of things that we aren't really in control of, is this idea that just focusing on my own stuff means I don't even have to give any concern of any kind to those things which are not in my control. And it's not quite how it works. The fact is we still have to live with, deal with, work with those things which are unchangeable. There is no shortage of things in the outside world that fit into that category of we're not in control of it, it keeps on doing its own thing, we struggle to either gain control over it or deal with the fact that we're not in control of it. And in fact, there's a lot of research shows that that struggle, that sense of I'm not able to deal with is of course the source of a lot of pain and anguish which is unresolved because there doesn't come a point at which we are in control of that or in which it magically goes our way somehow. Things like a health diagnosis um, that might take us by surprise and might defy all the good care we've been taking for of ourselves. A financial crisis. You're saving up millions, doing well. And, you know, the economy collapses. Um, or the bank was cheating you. Or something that is right outside of your control, despite your best efforts. That creates even more anguish. And we use that word unfair. The world is unfair. It's unfair. Or worse, what did I do to deserve it? What did I do wrong? We've got this very deeply built-in notion of punishment and reward that is partly, you know, related obviously to childhood where that does happen to us, but also related to the kind of culture we have, especially the Western religion, religious traditions tend to be based around this idea of punishment and reward. Other traditions presumably do similar things occasionally, but the end result is that as an adult, we end up rather naively assuming that if we do good and behave ourselves and do the right thing all the time, the right thing will always happen back to us. And when it doesn't, we call it unfair. And it is a rather naive view of the world because it contradicts our everyday experience of it, which is that it isn't fair. <laughs> It is correct that it's unfair. There isn't anyone supposed to be making it more fair for you. You have to deal with the real dilemma is, how do I deal with what I'm not in control of? Relationship stuff. You know, it's so close because it's our heart. It's so close to us that when, when stuff happens in our relationships, we really struggle to cope when we're not in control and when it's not going the way that we want it to go. The unanticipated really threatens us. And not only because we want to know what's going to happen, because we want to be in control of what happens and how we respond. And control isn't about being a control junkie. It's not about being the powerful person or the person in charge. I mean, presumably sometimes it is. But what we're referring to here is about controlling the pain, anguish, and uncertainty of a difficult world. When we're not in control of those things that I've been talking about, finance, health, um, relationships, and so much more, we experience emotional anguish. Let's call it psychological anguish. So it's not about, I need to be the boss. It's more about, I don't want to feel anguish. I don't want to feel pain. We avoid pain tremendously. And of course, I don't want to believe that the world is unpredictable. Because if I accept that the world is unpredictable, I have to accept a certain amount of chaos about it. And for many of us, not Marcus Aurelius, the Stoic philosopher, but for many of us, that completely breaks down our vision of a meaningful cosmos in some way. We assume that if it's to be meaningful, then everything should go, well, not only hunky-dory, but somehow our way, and then all these other people going on. I mean, I'm always amazed when, you know, the, the football team that wins the cup 
claims that God was on their side. And I always wonder, what about the other side? What did they do wrong in that worldview? So, of course, that worldview doesn't make too much sense. And it's in that situation, it's not about what did we do wrong that we didn't win the game. It's accepting that we didn't win the game. And kind of, well, there must be some more steps from there because does that mean I should just be okay with everything that's terrible in the world? Does it mean that I should never do anything about anything? It's not that. It's the first step of a process. Acceptance. Accepting that we're not in control or identifying what we are only in control of is the first step in a process of living better in the world and removal of the pain and anguish, but it's not the whole process itself. As much as we might want things to change and be different in the future, and as much as it is justifiable to want that, the, the step of accepting the present moment is the first step to getting into the better, proper, good flow of life. Once our life is flowing more smoothly, by accepting the present and being in the present, we're more ready to deal with changes and perhaps, perhaps get into a situation where those outside uncontrollable circumstances aren't quite the same or are more responsive to our control. But fundamentally, acceptance is the key that converts fleeting moments of it's okay and it's happy, I'm happy, into an enduring, lasting form of happiness. To, you know, as, as some say, acceptance helps you move from feeling happy to actually being happy. And that is a very fundamental shift because it means that in any situation, kind of, no matter what's really going on, we've got the capacity to be happy despite what's going on. And being happy, despite what's going on, doesn't mean ignoring what's going on. And none of this means that we shouldn't be making any kind of an effort of some kind. You know, we also need to, to uh, learn to identify when it's appropriate to act on something and when it's more appropriate to accept something. What we often get wrong is the idea that acceptance means get over it. We should get over it and, you know, let go. Letting go is important. Sometimes getting over it is important, but acceptance doesn't automatically mean that, that you must give up on something. So, you know, being willing to accept that someone we love has died doesn't mean that you automatically get over the grief or that you shouldn't uh, experience that grief at all. That that grief is in some way um, means that you're not accepting. We need to make that distinction between accepting what we need to accept and getting over the difficulty that it's caused. So death is a great example of that because it is very important to accept when we lose something uh, because it is very important to accept when we lose someone. And even not only death, it's important to accept when we lose anything, when we lose the, the job or the application or the opportunity, when we don't win. It doesn't mean you have to be happy about it. And it doesn't invalidate the feelings of grief, in fact, which you ought to feel about that. It would be a little bit weird if you didn't feel grief at the loss of someone or some kind of uh, grief at the loss of anything else. But acceptance is what's going to help that grief not turn into a deep, scarry kind of pain that is going to feed into a process of helping you keep aware of and on top of that which you are in control of as opposed to that which you aren't. So being willing to acknowledge something, being willing to accept something, doesn't require you to deny that something. We can accept that someone dies and still experience grief. In order to not experience grief, we don't have to pretend that the person didn't die. 
and we certainly can't rail against it because it's something outside of our control that we needed to accept. Well, one of the most common, I suppose, is a characteristic that your partner has that you have a difficulty accepting. There are some extreme ones, and some of those you might even be wondering what are you actually doing in that relationship. But if you fail to accept a quality that you don't like in someone close to you, that means that every time it comes up, you will suffer pain, anguish, anger, grief, all of those kind of things. You're not addressing the fact that you, that, that other person is who they are and you're not in control of that. So you can experience anger and confusion and frustration and you will have a strong desire that things should be different. We often even say in a relationship things should be like this or you should be like that. If only you didn't do X, Y and Z, if only you weren't that way, then everything would be fabulous. Well, of course, that's the whole issue about acceptance and knowing the boundaries of what we control and what we don't. If we were in control of everything, everything would be fabulous. And what we sometimes fail to hear is if you say to someone, if only you didn't have that characteristic, our relationship would be fine. What we're really saying to them is if only you accepted my control of you, telling you when you may display or not that characteristic, then our relationship would be fine. Think about that. That is often in the substance of failing to accept something about who they are, how they behave, and what their characteristic is. Most importantly, in a relationship like everywhere else, you need to be in the present, you need to be in the here and now and accepting what's going on in the here and now. You know, you can maybe take it to really challenging characteristics. Say your partner has a tendency to dramatically explode and throw things around the room when they're angry. And I'm saying you should accept that your partner has uh, characteristics that you're not in control of. If it makes you uncomfortable, that thought that you should accept, you might be confusing accepting with condoning. Accepting, acceptance with approval. Just because you accept something doesn't mean you approve of it. Not at all. There's actually no ne necessary relationship between those things. Remember the root of acceptance is, I understand which part of the universe I'm not in control of. That doesn't mean you should condone what's going on in that universe that you're not in control of. Acceptance is about acknowledging what is, about what has already happened. Whereas approving or condoning is consenting to more of the same in the future. And again, more, acceptance means even I might know that this is going to happen again. But the difference is consent. So if we acknowledge what's happened and think, well, increasingly, I have to wonder for my own life, knowing what I'm not in control of, does this work for my life? Does my life work this way? You don't have to say to your partner, you must change that characteristic or you must do what I say. You must be able to say to yourself, can I live in a relationship that includes that? You must be able to say to your partner, I can't live in a relationship that includes that. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I can't control you. That part's up to you. But for me, in my world, I can't live in a relationship that has that. What do I do from here? Firstly, Acceptance doesn't mean liking or wanting or choosing or supporting. It doesn't mean you endorse what you're accepting. It doesn't mean you like your anxiety or your pain or you would choose this body if you could or that you support that injustice. It simply means that you're choosing to allow it to be there because you can't change it and it's teaching you to redirect your focus. The second important thing to bear in mind about acceptance 
is that it is a process that requires practice. It can even require effort at times. Most of the time, it requires a certain amount of effort. We are in a situation that is causing frustration or pain or some other negative emotional response. And so it is going to be difficult to deal with it. But if we constantly practice it and work at it again and again, by doing it again and again, it becomes easier. It becomes second nature to do it. We might still go through a whole bunch of stuff, but we can get ourselves into the mode, make it happen, and do it. We create strength, and very importantly, we create new ways of thinking and new ways of understanding. It doesn't remove the fact that that stuff happens, or that this is your body, or that you've got that chronic pain, but it shifts how you respond to it and how you deal with it. So practice compassion. Practice compassion with yourself, and compassion even towards those who create the painful circumstances that you're not in control of. Practice acceptance of the challenges you're having. Practicing acceptance. Practice, practice, practice. Catch yourself not accepting. Ask yourself, how can I practice that better? Thirdly, acceptance does not mean that you're not working at changing something. If you accept, it doesn't mean you've given up that you're apathetic, that you don't care. It means that you need to take appropriate action in the circumstance, starting off by asking yourself what is under my purvey and under control. What are the changes I cannot accept? What do I live with? You can also you can accept your body and still work to change it. So that means I'm changing it because I want to get I want it to be better, not I don't like it the way it is. That's an important, subtle maybe, but very important shift. Not, I hate this body, I must fix it. I love this body, I can make it even more lovable, or make it better, or make it different in some way. So, accepting the behavior does not mean there is no option to change the behavior. Acceptance doesn't mean this is forever. Acceptance, well, the world isn't static. Stuff is changing all the time. That's the whole point of what are we not in control of. So acceptance is not a way of saying, okay, well, this is how it is. L live with it or not. There's still things we do to change stuff. There's still things we do to change our own life. And there's still things that are going to change all the time that we constantly need to be in response to. So I can respond to the changes that happen. I can learn to accept them but I'm still devising strategies to improve my own life by focusing on what I'm in control of. And those things don't have to be different. I can accept that this is my body. I'm not in control of my genes. But I can also be in control of my lifestyle and improve that body and still feel happy, groovy, the whole way along. Here are just some thoughts from Marcus Aurelius. He says, even if you burst with indignation, they will still carry on regardless. So, first, do not be upset. All things follow the nature of the whole. And in a little while, you will be no one and nowhere, as is true of everyone. But more fundamentally, Marcus deals with the acceptance of death, something which is a much more important part of Stoic philosophy, and which, at some point, we're even going to devote a whole show to, because it's a very key concept that the Stoics had. One example, anyway, of something he says about it is, Nature's aim for everything includes its cessation, just as much as its beginning and its duration. Like someone throwing up a ball. How can it be good for the ball to go up and bad for it to come down or hit the ground? How can it be good for a bubble when it forms, but not when it bursts? A candle when it burns, but not when it goes out or snuffs out. He goes on later to say, he who fears death fears either unconsciousness or another sort of consciousness. Now, if you will no longer be conscious, you won't have to be conscious of, every, of anything bad. So, if it's unconsciousness you fear in death, you'll be unconscious, so what's the problem? And if you are to take on a different consciousness, you will be a different being, and you'll still be alive. So, what's there to fear about that? Pointing out things that you're not in control of. The ultimate thing we're not in control of is life itself. 
and death. The Stoics worked very hard on accepting death as the ultimate what you're not in control of. Because ultimately, in the acceptance of death, that it will come. You free yourself to live the most powerful, happy life in the present. In the acceptance of what you're not in control of, you free yourself from pain. Well, there's always a lot of homework, something we've all got to work at, but something that we can all achieve. It's really, really simple if you think about it. I'll be back next week to look at the month ahead. Join me then.